as, as Mike uh, just sort of intimated, and as you've heard uh, earlier in the meeting, and you probably will hear later in the meeting, we're moving toward major control of the biology of aging, but what can we do in the meantime? I'm going to tell you how cryopreservation fits into that equation in our opinion. I'm the uh, Chief Scientific Officer and Vice President of 21st Century Medicine. We're here locally in Fontana, California. We have a website and uh, much of what I'm going to tell you about today uh, can be supplemented with reprints uh, on request or by checking our website. We have PDFs for a lot of our publications. However, a lot of the stuff that I'll tell you today has not been published yet. Um, and by the way, uh, is, uh, by way of introduction, um, uh, as was mentioned before, I'm uh, the editor of uh, The Future of Aging, which is coming out uh, next year. And there are some flyers uh, for that book at this meeting if you have any curiosity about that. Okay, so at 21st Century Medicine, we think that cryopreservation may save your life and it may make your life better in various ways. Now, how can that be? First of all, let's make sure we're all on the, on the same page. It dawned on me that not everybody might feel comfortable with the word cryopreservation. So let's just make it real clear what we're talking about. Cryopreservation refers to preservation of living systems at cryogenic temperatures, preferably in a viable or living state. And you're all familiar with sperm banks, frozen embryos, frozen blood banks. Um, so that's kind of what cryopreservation is. But there's actually two different ways of getting cryopreservation done. Uh, all, of those, oops, all of those conventional examples deal with freezing as the method of cryopreservation. But there is another method of cryopreservation called vitrification, which means glass formation. And we'll talk about that. Uh, the second point I need to make to the audience once again is why is cryopreservation relevant in a meeting that's largely devoted to aging? And uh, there's at least three reasons. Um, one is that we're not at radical life extension yet. Uh, you could die of a heart attack you know, or, or an impending problem of that nature uh, before we get to our hopeful, uh, hoped for goal of uh, eliminating the aging process. So if we could bank organs and have them available to replace old failing organs, we could just by brute force extend your life when it would otherwise be forestalled by aging, just by taking out the aging organ and putting in a young one. So that's a bridge to radical life extension for the time uh, that we're living in in the present time. Um, there's also um, value in um, protecting yourself against uh, life-threatening uh, accidents or other kinds of accidents that reduce your quality of life. Uh, for example, uh, if you ingest the wrong substance, uh, your kidney may stop working or your liver may stop working. Uh, and if you had a bank of organs that were available locally, uh, would allow you to possibly get a bridge to the time when your organ might heal itself. Um, Another example is preservation of fertility. Uh, a lot of people get cancer and survive it nowadays, but very often you are infertile as a result of the cancer. If you could preserve uh, gametes or uh, uh, sexual tissue, uh, ovarian or testicular tissue, prior to getting chemotherapy, you might have fertility later. And many ladies find uh, that by being professionals and having to postpone reproduction to later ages, they jeopardize their ability to reproduce. And by being able to bank egg cells or ovarian tissue, that problem could be overcome. Another kind of accident uh, is going to be summarized for you by Freitas and Merkel later today, and they know what I'm talking about, but um, uh, hedging your bets against uh, causes of death of various kinds uh, it will, will be one of the uh, applications of this technology that they'll talk about. Finally, um, We've investigated the uh, process of drug discovery, and the process of drug discovery is currently very costly and slowed down by the difficulty of screening drugs effectively. And if you had banks of really uh, high quality human liver tissue, for example, available to drug uh, houses, they could uh, facilitate drug screening of all kinds and of anti-aging drugs in particular. So if you want to uh, have a company that's devoted to life extension, um, it's helpful to know what people die of. So it turns out, um, based on my reading of the National Vital Statistics Report back in 2002 and 2005, 
that uh, over a third of all people die ultimately of organ failure uh, that could be prevented by an organ transplant if an organ were available to transplant. Um, most of these are hearts, of course, but there are many other organs uh, that uh, fail as you get older or have other problems. Uh, that adds up to 2,400 deaths every single day that might be uh, prevented if we could just deliver an organ to you when you needed it. Uh, in fact, if you look at what that would do to the human mortality curve, uh, it would actually shift it noticeably uh, to the right and increases your, your chances of surviving to the age of 90 uh, by quite a lot compared to your chances of surviving to that age now. Now, it may seem like a kind of a crazy idea to imagine that you could do this sort of thing because, um, you know, it's not easy to make organs in a laboratory to meet the demand. We certainly don't have enough cadaver organs to go around. Uh, however, uh, people that study this for a living, people that are building organs in the laboratory every day, uh, they think it's going to work. And uh, some of these deans uh, of tissue engineering opined in the May 2009 issue of Scientific American that actually one in every five people older than 65 in developed nations is going to benefit from organ replacement technology at some point in their lives. And if you, if you do the numbers, that comes out to 7.4 million people in the United States alone. This is a non-trivial uh, impact on, on the future of aging, you might say. Uh, the amount of money that's been spent uh, on developing artificial organ replacements is over a billion dollars easily. And uh, the renal assist device, which is made of um, renal tubules uh, in part, is actually now saving the lives of people that have acute uh, renal failure uh, from a variety of causes. Uh, it's just a bridge. The kidney will heal itself eventually, and, and you can get off the device for, for the time being. But eventually that technology will get to the point where it can be chronic and implantable and convenient to use. There are bioartificial bladders and other organs uh, that are uh, functioning perfectly well in human beings today, made from their own cells. Um, and there's uh, bioartificial livers coming online uh, for clinical trials as early as next year. Uh, there are multiple books on the subject. Uh, it is a field that's expanding and exploding. It will have a future that kind of will hopefully happen soon enough to impact uh, the aging process. But how are you going to make this practical? Um, I think that cryopreservation comes into it because of what I might call a shoe store problem. How would you operate a shoe store if the shoes went bad 24 hours after you got them into the store? You wouldn't sell very many. How do you operate a blood bank if the blood that you got into the bank from your donor went bad 24 hours after you got it in? It would be difficult. It would be difficult. And so imagine trying to transplant a million organs every year without fail as soon as you generated them in the laboratory. It's just not likely to happen. So just common sense would indicate that cryopreservation is going to be critical to the full development of this aspect of regenerative medicine. Just to elaborate slightly on the emergency use of organ transplants, that's not possible with current technology. If, if you need an organ, you usually have some forewarning of it, and they put you on a list, and you wait for five years, and eventually you get the organ. But if we could manufacture enough organs to satisfy the demand for it, they could all be made in a central facility and then stored at various places, uh, probably hospitals, around the country so that if you had acute renal failure or uh, acute uh, hepatic poisoning, you could get one of these uh, uh, replacements. Uh, also, you can imagine re um, saving the lives of policemen or soldiers or other accident victims who've had major organ system damage by being able to replace the organs quickly. Now, I mentioned before that there are two ways of crowd preserving things. One is by vitrification. Uh, one is by freezing. We think vitrification is better because unlike freezing, it has the advantages of being applicable to systems of any size and complexity. There's no optimal cooling or warming rates to deal with like you have for different kinds of cells with conventional preservation. And obviously there's no ice crystal damage because you're not allowing ice to form even though you're going to cryogenic temperatures. If you want to do this though, you have to be able to do 
some things that are not easy. You have to be able to make very low toxicity mixtures of chemicals that replace water to prevent it from freezing. These are called cryoprotectants and they're biological antifreeze agents, you might say. Uh, 21st century medicine has the best solutions known so far and they go with names like that. Uh, you also have to be able to prevent injury from cooling per se in the absence of ice formation and 21st is way ahead of everybody else in that department as well. We also have ice blockers that prevent ice crystals from getting started. We have ice growth inhibitors uh, and we have computer controlled protocols for adding and removing potentially very dangerously high concentrations of crowd protectants. All of that gives us major advantages in this, in this field.